Uh, you can see the first argument up there that we discussed. This is Leibniz's form of the cosmological argument. Everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. The universe exists. Three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external transcendent personal cause. And from those three premises, the conclusion follows, therefore, the explanation of the universe is an external transcendent personal cause. So if those three premises are true, the conclusion fo four follows logically. And I do think that each of those three premises is more plausibly true than false, and so I think that is a good argument for the existence of a metaphysically necessary external transcendent personal cause of the universe. So let's go to our second argument, uh, which concerns the origin of the universe. Uh, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, what might we say on behalf of this argument? Well, it seems to me that the most controversial premise will be the second premise, that the universe began to exist. And I think that we can give both philosophical and scientific arguments in support of that premise. Philosophically, the idea of an actually infinite number of past events seems to be metaphysically absurd. If the universe never began to exist, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But the existence of an actually infinite number of things in the real world seems to result in metaphysical absurdities. For example, um, suppose you had an actually infinite number of coins number one, two, three, and so forth to infinity. And suppose that I took away all of the odd-numbered coins. How many coins would you have left? Well, you'd still have all the even-numbered coins, or an infinity of coins. So infinity minus infinity is infinity. But now suppose instead that I took away all of the coins numbered greater than three, four, five, six, seven, and so on to infinity. Now how many coins would you have left? Well, just three, right? So infinity minus infinity is three. In fact, you can get any number from zero to infinity as a result of subtracting infinity from infinity. And in each case, you take away an identical number of coins from an identical number of coins and come up with non-identical results. And for this reason, the inverse operations of subtraction and division are simply prohibited mathematically in transfinite arithmetic. But while you can slap the hand of the mathematician that tries to subtract infinity from infinity. You can't keep people from giving away what coins they want to give away. You can give away whichever coins that you want. So it seems to me that this gives reason for thinking that an actually infinite number of things cannot exist in reality. The idea of an actually infinite number of things is just an idea in your mind, not something that really exists. David Hilbert who was perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, wrote, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But if infinity is just an idea and not something that exists in reality, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe must be finite. And therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. Now, this 
purely philosophical conclusion has been confirmed during the last century by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, in one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13.7 billion years ago. And this event is called the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so uh, startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing, physically speaking. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves come into being at the Big Bang. As the physicist P.C.W. Davies explains, and I quote, the coming into being of the universe, as discussed in modern science, is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing, end quote. Now, of course, alternative theories have been formulated over the years to try to avoid this absolute beginning. But none of these theories has commended itself to the scientific community as more plausible than the uh, models with a beginning. In fact, in the year uh, 2003, three cosmologists, Arvind Bord, uh, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove or craft a theorem which proved that any universe which is in a state of cosmic expansion over its history on average cannot be eternal in the past but must have an absolute beginning. And this board guth vilenkin theorem applies not only to the standard Big Bang cosmology, but also to quantum gravity theories, inflationary models of the universe, and even higher dimensional so-called brain cosmologies. Vilenkin pulls no punches. This is what he says. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning, end quote. Now, certain speculative theories have been floated to try to avoid the implication of the bord guth vilenkin theorem. Uh, and these speculative theories are fraught with uh, problems, but the more fundamental point is that, that they only succeed in pushing the beginning back a step. None of them is able to restore an eternal past to the universe. So Vilenkin, this past January at a conference in Cambridge University on the uh, birthday of Stephen Hawking's uh, 70th uh, year, uh, had this to say. He said, all the evidence we have says that the universe began to exist. Now that's a remarkable statement. Think about that. He's not saying the evidence for a beginning outweighs the evidence against a beginning. Rather, what he says is that all the evidence we have says that the universe has a beginning. So even if this evidence is by its very nature provisional and, and tentative, nevertheless, it's, it, it's all on one side of the scale. And that is that the universe began to exist. Now, this raises the obvious question then, why did the universe begin to exist? Uh, as Anthony Kinney of Oxford University has written, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. That the universe sprang into being uncaused from nothing. And surely that doesn't make sense, for that conclusion is, in the words of the German philosopher of science, Baron of Kandigscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science. 
namely the metaphysical principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So, why does the universe exist? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being, which is the first premise of the second argument. Uh, whatever begins to exist has a cause. We have philosophical and scientific evidence for premise two, that the universe began to exist, from which it follows logically three, therefore the universe has a cause. Now, from the very nature of the case, as the cause of the universe, of space and time, matter and energy, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. It has to be uncaused because we've seen there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. Uh, so we have to come to an absolutely first uncaused cause. It has to be changeless and therefore timeless, at least without the universe, sans the universe, because it created time. Because it also created space, it must transcend space as well, and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Moreover, I want to argue, this cause must also be personal. Just ask yourself this question. How else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect with a beginning, like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal, a mechanically operating set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. If the necessary and sufficient conditions are permanently given, then the cause, or the effect rather, would be permanently given. Uh, to illustrate, imagine that the cause of water's freezing is the temperature being below zero degrees centigrade. Now, if the temperature were below zero degrees from eternity, any water that was around would be frozen from eternity. It would be impossible for the water to just begin to freeze a finite time ago. So if the cause is permanently there and is sufficient for its effect, the effect must be permanently there as well. So how can you have a timeless eternal cause, but a temporal effect that only begins to exist about 13.7 billion years ago. Well, it seems to me that the only way out of this dilemma is that the cause of the universe is a personal agent who is endowed with freedom of the will and who can therefore spontaneously create a new effect without any antecedent determining conditions. Philosophers call this kind of causation agent causation. And it seems to me that this is the best way to explain the origin of the universe from a timeless cause. Uh, to give an illustration of this, imagine a man who has been sitting from eternity and then he freely wills to stand up. In this case, you would have an effect with the beginning in time arise from a cause that has existed permanently from eternity. So on this basis, I think we are brought not simply to a transcendent first cause of the origin of the universe, but to its personal creator. So this second argument, which is also a form of the cosmological argument, will give us a beginningless, changeless, timeless, immaterial, uh, spaceless, um, enormously powerful, personal creator of the universe, which is a core concept of what the theist means by God. Um, let me just ask if there are any questions about this second argument before we continue. Yes? Uh, when you go about uh, the thing with the universe, uh, the universe that there are multiple universes, they're just maybe expanding and collapsing on itself, so we say that Right, right. The, the question was, what about oscillating models of the universe in which it expands and contracts? These models were floated back in the 1970s uh, by various cosmologists as an attempt to avoid 
the beginning of the universe, and they've now been largely abandoned uh, because they run into various problems. One would be the thermodynamic properties of oscillating models. Entropy in these models is uh, conserved from cycle to cycle. That is to say, the, uh, the amount of usable energy in the universe declines as the cycles go on. And this has the pe peculiar effect of making each cycle have a, a longer expansion time and a larger expansion radius so that the expansions of this kind of model would actually look like this uh, on into the future. So it has an infinite future, but it has only a finite past. In fact, one scientist, Joseph Silk, has estimated on the basis of current entropy levels, the universe could not have gone through more than about 100 of these previous oscillations. Another problem is that in order to oscillate from eternity, where you would have absolutely equal cycles, is it would require infinite fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe. And we'll talk about the fine-tuning argument in a moment. And that fine-tuning would have to be extremely bizarre because it would have to be set at past infinity. But how can you have the initial conditions of the universe infinitely fine-tuned at past infinity when there is no beginning on this model? So these oscillating models, I think, uh, have also uh, been largely discredited as a way of trying to restore an eternal past. Any other question about this second uh, argument? All right, if you're interested in reading more about this, take a look at my book, Reasonable Faith, where I go through some of these alternative models like oscillating theories, string cosmology, cyclic ekpyrotic models, inflationary models, and so forth. Uh, and, and those uh, and their problems are discussed. In the interest of time, let me move on to the next argument, which is based upon the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. And that is the argument here that is partially concealed. Whoops. Not that one. Okay. There we go. This one. Um, during the last half century or so, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the existence of intelligent life in the universe depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions which were simply given in the Big Bang itself. Scientists once thought that whatever the initial conditions of the universe might have been, eventually, given enough time, life might evolve somewhere in the cosmos. But, in fact, we have now discovered that intelligent life is balanced on a knife's edge of incomparable fineness. The existence of intelligent, interactive, embodied life uh, anywhere in the cosmos depends upon a conspiracy of initial conditions given in the Big Bang which must be fine-tuned to a complexity and a, a precision which is literally incalculable and incomprehensible. Now this fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants of nature, like the gravitational constant. And these constants are independent of the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values of these constants. Secondly, in addition to these constants, there are also certain arbitrary quantities, which are simply put in as initial conditions at the beginning of the universe on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy in the early universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities must fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values in order for the universe to be life-permitting. 
Were these constants or quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, this life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. Now, there are three possibilities for explaining this extraordinary fine-tuning of the universe, and these are stated in premise one. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, the first uh, alternative, physical necessity, says that there is some unknown theory of everything, uh, or a TOE, T-O-E is the acronym for this, a theory of everything. A TOE which would explain why the universe is the way it is. This theory of everything would uh, show that really there was no chance, or little chance, of the universe is not being life permitted. By contrast, the second alternative, chance, says that the fine-tuning is entirely due to chance. It's just an accident that the universe is life-permitting, and we're the lucky beneficiaries. The third alternative rejects both of these explanations in favor of the existence of an intelligent mind which designed the cosmos to be life-permitting. And so the question is, which of these alternatives is the most plausible explanation of the fine-tuning? And uh, we can examine these then in premise two. Now the first alternative, uh, chance, or rather a physical necessity, is extraordinarily implausible because, as I've said, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. The laws of nature permit a wide range of values of these constants and quantities. For example, the most uh, promising candidate for a toe to date is superstring theory, or so-called M theory. And M theory permits a cosmic landscape of around 10 to the 500th power uh, number of universes which are consistent with nature's laws but which vary in the values of their fundamental constants. So clearly M theory doesn't do anything to render the values of the fundamental constants physically necessary. Uh, on the contrary, there's this incomprehensibly large range of values that these constants might take on M theory. So, what about the second alternative, chance? Um, the problem with this alternative is that the odds against the universes being life permitting are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. Even though there will be within this cosmic landscape a large number of universes which are uh, fine-tuned for life, nevertheless, the proportion of those universes to the landscape as a whole is uh, almost infinitesimal in its uh, size, so that a dart thrown randomly at the cosmic landscape would have no meaningful chance of striking a life-permitting, fine-tuned universe. So, in order to rescue the alternative of chance, its proponents have therefore been forced to adopt the extraordinary hypothesis that there exists an infinite number of randomly ordered parallel universes undetectable by us, composing a kind of world ensemble or collection of universes, sometimes called a multiverse, uh, of which our universe is but a tiny part. And somewhere in this infinite world ensemble, finely tuned universes will appear by chance alone, and lucky us, we happen to be in one such world. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this is where the debate over fine-tuning lies today. The 
uh, multiverse or world ensemble hypothesis is a kind of backhanded complement to the design argument because otherwise sober scientists would not be resorting to so metaphysical an extraordinary hypothesis as the world ensemble unless they felt very keenly uh, the force of this fine-tuning argument for design. And so this is where the debate lies today between either the world ensemble hypothesis, the multiverse, and chance, or intelligent design. There are, however, at least I think two major failings with the world ensemble hypothesis that make it less plausible than a designer. First of all is that there's no evidence that such a world ensemble exists. Nobody knows if there are other universes at all, much less universes that are randomly ordered in their constants and quantities and infinite in number. Uh, we're required to believe much more than just that there are other universes, but that they are also randomly ordered and preferably infinite. Moreover, remember that Bohr, Guth, and Vilenkin uh, prove that any universe which is in a state of cosmic expansion on average over its history cannot be infinite in the past. And the bohr guth vilenkin theorem applies to the multiverse as well. So that means that the multiverse itself had to have a beginning and is finite in the past. And that implies that if the universe or the multiverse is finite in the past, it may be the case that only a finite number of other universes has formed by now in the multiverse, and then there's no guarantee that a finely tuned universe will have appeared by chance in the world ensemble. Secondly, though, and even more fundamentally, uh, and this point has been uh, forcefully pressed by Roger Penrose of uh, Oxford University, if our universe is but a member of a randomly ordered world ensemble, then we should be expecting to see a much different universe than the one we in fact observe. Penrose has pointed out that it is uh, incomprehensibly more probable that our solar system would form instantly through the random collision of particles than that a finely tuned universe like ours should exist. In fact, he calls it utter chicken feed by comparison. It is so much more probable that our solar system would just fall together by the random collision of particles than that a finely tuned universe would exist. So if our universe were just a random member of a world ensemble, it is inconceivably more probable that we would be observing an island of order no larger than our solar system. Why? Well, because observable universes like those are simply incomprehensibly more probable than a finely tuned universe like ours. And therefore, by far, there are uh, more universes that are observable in the world ensemble in which our solar system just falls instantaneously into being through the random collision of particles than observable universes that are finely tuned. Or similarly, if our universe were just a random member of a world ensemble, then we ought to be observing highly extraordinary events like horses popping into and going out of existence or pink bunny rabbits beating bass drums popping in and out of existence because those things are vastly more probable than the appearance of a finely tuned universe. Observable universes like those are simply more plentiful in the world ensemble than finely tuned universes and therefore ought to be observed by us. And since we do not have such observations, that strongly disconfirms the world ensemble hypothesis. On atheism, at least, I think it is therefore highly improbable that there is a world ensemble. Uh, and Penrose has said that these uh, world ensemble attempts to explain the fine-tuning of the universe are therefore really worse than useless 
because they are disconfirmed by our observations. So it follows then the premise too that the fine tuning is not due to physical necessity or to chance, that three, uh, logically it follows, therefore it is due to design. It therefore follows that the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe is design unless, unless design can be shown to be equally implausible as uh, the world ensemble explanation. So is this a plausible explanation? Well, uh, someone like Richard Dawkins has objected that the uh, hypothesis of a divine designer is just as implausible as the world ensemble. Why? Well, he says that an intelligent mind uh, also exhibits complex order, so that if the universe needs an explanation, then so does the designer. Uh, and so this raises the question, who designed the designer? And if you say, well, the designer doesn't need an explanation, then why think that the universe needs an explanation? Now it seems to me that this objection to inferring design as the best explanation of fine tuning is based upon a misconception of the nature of explanation. It is widely recognized in the philosophy of science that for an explanation to be the best, you don't need to have an explanation of the explanation. Let me repeat that. For an explanation to be recognized as the best, you don't need to have an explanation of the explanation. Indeed, if you think about it, such a requirement would lead to an infinite regress so that nothing could be explained and science would be destroyed. For before you could recognize anything as the explanation of some phenomenon, you need an explanation of the explanation. But before you could recognize that, you need an explanation of the explanation of the explanation, and so on to infinity, so that nothing could ever be explained. So, to illustrate, if uh, archaeologists were to find in the earth things that looked like pottery shards and arrowheads and tomahawk heads, they would be justified in inferring that these are not the products of sedimentation and metamorphosis, but were the artifacts of intelligent designers, even if they had absolutely no explanation of who these people were or uh, how they made these things. Or similarly, if astronauts were to find on the backside of the moon a pile of machinery that they knew neither the Americans nor the Soviets had, had put there, uh, they would be justified in inferring that this was a result of some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence, even if they had no explanation of who these people were or how that machinery came to be there. In order to recognize an explanation as the best, you don't need to have an explanation of the explanation. And so in the same way, the design hypothesis as being the best explanation of the fine-tuning doesn't require that we be able to explain the designer. That can simply be left an open question for future inquiry. Moreover, and this is the second point I want to make, the complexity of a mind is not really analogous to the complexity of the universe. A mind's ideas might be complex, but a mind itself is a remarkable a uh, simple entity. It, it has no physical parts. It's an immaterial entity that is not composed of pieces or separable parts. And its properties like intelligence, self-consciousness, and volition are not contingent, uh, but are essential to its nature. And, and so it's, it's simply confused to think that because a mind's ideas might be complex, that a mind itself is complex. Uh, a mind itself is a remarkably simple entity, so that to postulate a, a mind behind the universe is definitely uh, to posit a much, much simpler explanation than the complex universe with all its contingent and variegated constants and quantities. 
So I think that the uh, conclusion does follow that in fact the best explanation of the fine tuning of the universe is design. And so this argument gives us a transcendent uh, being who is an intelligent personal designer of the universe who has designed the laws of nature uh, to be life permitting. Any comment or question about this uh, argument from fine tuning? Yes? Good question. What about the God of the gaps objection? Does this argument fall prey to the God of the gaps objection? Now, what is the God of the gaps objection? This is a sort of slogan that is used by detractors of design and other arguments by saying that you can't use God to plug up the gaps in our scientific knowledge. Just because you're ignorant of something doesn't mean you can plug God in to fill the gap, to plug our ignorance. And I completely agree with that. I do not think we should use God of the gaps reasoning. So the question is, does this argument commit God of the gaps fallacy? Well, no. I mean, where does it commit this? Certainly not premise one. Premise one just lists the alternatives. Physical necessity, chance, or design. It, it just lists the alternatives. Premise two, no, because when we disqualify physical necessity or chance, one doesn't appeal to God to disqualify those. Richard Dawkins, for example, rejects the alternative of physical necessity uh, on the basis of what I said about the wide range of values that the laws of nature permit. He, he agrees with Sir Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, that physical necessity is not a good explanation of the fine tuning. As for chance, that runs into the objections raised by Roger Penrose. Again, no theist. He's an agnostic, as far as I know. These arguments have nothing to do with God, but show why this is also not a good alternative. And so there isn't any God of the gaps reasoning, it seems to me, here. One is weighing the alternatives, uh, and these alternatives have uh, serious shortcomings. We looked at a possible shortcoming of the design hypothesis, the who designed the designer objection, and I, I think turned that back successfully. So it seems to me that this is a, a perfectly sound inference to God as the best explanation of the fine tuning, and it in no way appeals to ignorance to postulate God. Yes, you want to follow up? I agree, but what about the argument that you can't find all the universes? You can, you can, uh, you can say that there are multiple uh, universes, but you can't uh, see anything else but what's in this universe. Yes, now if I understand the question, you're saying what about these other universes in the world ensemble, uh, you can't find them, and so forth. That was, in a way, my first point. Remember, I said there's no evidence for the existence of a world ensemble of randomly ordered universes. Now, well, let, me, let me finish. We don't have any evidence for the existence of those things. By contrast, we do have independent arguments for the existence of God, such as the contingency argument and the cosmological argument. So the God hypothesis, I think, is superior to the world ensemble hypothesis in that we have independent evidence for the existence of God, which we do not have for the world ensemble hypothesis. But then the second and more important objection to the world ensemble hypothesis is Penrose's. Even if we do not have access to these other worlds, Penrose's argument is that our observations of this universe should be radically different if we are just a random member of a world ensemble. And so on the basis of observable science, we can disqualify the world ensemble hypothesis as an explanation of the fine tuning. Another question about the fine tuning argument. Yes? Um, in the first uh, argument, uh, you said that it's either physical necessity, chance, or design, but what if there is a fourth? Yes. The, the question is, what if there's a fourth alternative? What if premise one is incomplete? 
Well, then, if there is a fourth alternative, we invite our friend, our conversation partner, to tell us what it is, and then we will add it happily to the first one. But I'm, I'm just not aware of what it, would, what it is. And I'm, I'm thoroughly familiar with the literature on fine-tuning, and these are the alternatives that are discussed in the literature, and I, I'm not aware of another alternative. But you're certainly right. If someone can think of one, then we need to add it to the list and, and then talk about it and assess it. So then that's a gap. What? Then, then there's a gap. No, no, that's not a god of the gaps. That's, that's, I mean, think of the theory of biological evolution. The theory, of the, how did biological complexity arise on this planet? You could say, well, it might be due to genetic mutation and natural selection. Or you could have a Lamarckian theory. Uh, no, it's because animals adapted to their environment and then they passed on those adaptations to their offspring. Um, or you might have some other theory. And, and what a scientist would do is then pick which of the alternatives is the best explanation. And to say, well, there's some unknown explanation is not to offer an alternative explanation. That, that's just ignorance. You, it, it, you, you have to offer some sort of an alternative in order for that to qualify as another explanation. Another way to put it would be this way. In inference to the best explanation, what scientists do is they assemble a pool of live options for explaining a certain set of empirical data. And then they weigh these options by various criteria to determine which is the best explanation. And it's not an alternative to say, oh, well, there's some unknown explanation. That, that isn't to offer any explanation. That's, that's just nothing. So there's nothing to weigh. There's nothing to assess. So until someone mentions the alternative, you're perfectly rational to proceed in this way. Otherwise, it would lead to absolute skepticism. Uh, again, it would, it would destroy science. So if someone comes up with another alternative, they're welcome to add it, and, and we'd, we'd be obliged to assess it. All right, well again, in the interest of time, let's press on to our next argument, which is a moral argument. If naturalism or atheism is true, then I think it's plausible that objective moral values, and we might add duties, um, do not exist. Now, what do I mean by the word objective? Well, to say that moral values and duties are objective is to say that something is good or evil, right or wrong, independently of whether we believe it to be so or not. So, for example, to say that Nazi anti-Semitism was wrong, objectively wrong, is to say that Nazi anti-Semitism was wrong and would still have been wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and brainwashed or exterminated everybody who disagreed with them so that everybody thought that the Holocaust was a good thing. That's what it means to say that moral values and duties are objective. It means that they're, they're binding and valid independently of whether uh, we believe in them or not. And the claim is that in the absence of God, moral values and duties are not objective in that way. So many atheists and theists alike uh, will agree with premise one, that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. For example, the late J.L. Mackey of Oxford University, who was one of the most influential atheists of our day, admitted, and I quote, if there are objective values, they make the existence of a god more probable than it would have been without them. Thus, we have a defensible argument from morality to the existence of a god." End quote. But instead of inferring that God exists, Mackey denied that objective moral values exist. He said, it is easy to explain this moral sense as a natural product of biological and social evolution. Michael Roos, who is an agnostic philosopher of science, agrees. 
This is what Roos says, and I quote, morality is a biological adaptation no less than our hands and feet and teeth considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something ethics is illusory i appreciate that when somebody says love thy neighbor as thyself they think they are referring above and beyond themselves nevertheless such reference is truly without foundation morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory." End quote. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the advent of nihilism, that is to say the destruction of all meaning and value in life. And I persuaded that Friedrich Nietzsche was right but we've got to be very careful here because this argument is often misunderstood. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I certainly think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? And like Mackey and Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by homo sapiens on this planet is objective. After all, on an atheistic view, what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. So on a naturalistic view, some action, for example, rape, might not be socially advantageous and so in the course of human development, it has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is morally wrong. On a naturalistic view, uh, there really isn't anything morally wrong with raping someone. Acts like this go on all the time in the animal kingdom. And thus without God, there doesn't seem to be any absolute right and wrong that would impose itself on our conscience. But that leads to premise two, but objective moral values and duties do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. And there's no more reason to deny the objective validity of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world around us. The reasoning of Michael Roos at best proves that our subjective perception of moral values has evolved through biological and social conditioning. But if moral values are gradually discovered rather than gradually invented, then our gradual and fallible perception of the moral realm no more undermines the objectivity of that realm than our fallible gradual apprehension of the physical realm undermines the objectivity of the physical world. In moral experience, I think we do apprehend objective moral values and duties. Even Michael Roos himself confesses, and listen to this quotation, he says, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Let me repeat that. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Notice that here, Roos ascribes to moral truths the same logical necessity that characterizes mathematical truths. Actions like rape and torture and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable 
behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are objectively wrong. Similarly, love, uh, self-sacrifice, and generosity are really good. But if objective moral values and duties cannot exist without God, and objective moral values and duties do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore God exists. Now, this is an interesting argument concerning the problem of evil. Because if this argument is sound, what it means is that evil actually proves the existence of God. We could argue as follows. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, evil exists. This is the premise supplied by the atheist. Some things are really evil. Three, therefore, objective moral values exist. Namely, some things are evil in the world, for therefore God exists. So paradoxically, even though evil at a superficial level seems to call into question God's existence, at a more fundamental level, evil actually serves to prove the existence of God. Since in the absence of God, good and evil as such would not exist. And therefore, I think we have good moral grounds for affirming the existence of God. Any question or comment about this argument for God's existence? Yes, up in the corner. A little louder, please. In my experience, premise one is far more controversial than you say it is. Yes, yes. I said some theists and atheists, well, no, I said many, and that's true. Many do concur with one. But, in fact, very few ethicists will want to deny two. Uh, most atheistic ethicists actually affirm the objectivity of moral values and duties. It's very paradoxical. Um, but when you press them, what is the basis for the value of human beings? On what grounds do you fir affirm intrinsic human rights and values? They have nothing to offer. The, the, the theories are explanatorily deficient. Uh, it's just by faith. And it's a, it's a leap of faith, I think, that flies in the face of what a naturalistic view of the world would seem to suggest. So you're, you're absolutely right that uh, many atheistic ethicists will deny one. Uh, they all affirm the existence of objective moral values and duties. Uh, but then you will notice that um, they have no explanatory basis for that, I think. I, their, their theories are explanatorily deficient. Do you want to follow up uh, with... That, that, that doesn't constitute a basis for premise one. No, I, I, I think that's true. Well, the basis for premise one is that God exists. What that constitutes is a commentary on your comment that many atheists do not agree with premise one. The grounds for premise one, as I say, is that in the absence of God as a transcendent foundation for moral value, there doesn't seem to be any explanation for why homo sapiens would have objective moral worth or objective moral duties. Um, why would homo sapiens have an objective moral duty to love their neighbor? As themselves, for example, who or what imposes that moral duty upon them? Where in the world would moral duties come from on naturalism? So the basis for one is that on naturalism, there just doesn't seem to be any ground for the affirmation of objective moral values and duties. And then that's why I said in response to your comment that atheists who do affirm premise two um, do so without supplying any moral explanation. They're, they're just doing it uh, gratuitously, as it were. So that, that's, that's, that would be the defense of premise one, is the explanatory deficiency of naturalism. Any other comment on this argument? But yes? Is that just your opinion that it's not a good, uh, what, what the naturalists are saying? Uh -huh. I agree with you personally. All right. I'm just saying, isn't it your opinion that aren't you the one saying that the naturalists are not coming up with well, now, we have to be careful about this sort of retort, you know, that's just your opinion. Everything I say is my opinion, 
right? But the question is, do I have good arguments in support of my opinion? Do I have good reasons for my opinion? And that's the real question, and I've given the argument for, for my opinion. I've given the argument for premise one, and now I think what the naturalist has to do is he has to explain to us either what is the basis on atheism or naturalism for affirming that human beings have objective moral value and duties, or alternatively, he needs to explain why no explanation is needed. But apart from that, then it's, it's, it's he who is just offering his opinion, right? Without any argument. I mean, two can play at that game of saying it's just your opinion. It is my opinion, but it's an opinion which I've attempted to support by argument. Okay, one more comment or question, and then we'll move ahead. It's just uh, actually for this too. Who did you just say that if you believe in the natural selection and evolution that objects and moral values do not exist? And then we couldn't get any further with the discussion. And you would just hold to that conclusion, yeah. even though you would say that we do have good uh, reasons to believe in objects and moral values. Right. In other words, Someone might deny, too, by saying that moral values and duties are just illusions that have been brought about by biological and social evolution. That was the view of Michael Roos, whom I quoted. And I find this very useful because I think if there is no God, they're absolutely right. If there is no God, it does seem to me that Homo sapiens suffers from sort of a delusions of moral grandeur. But if there is a God, and this was the point I tried to make, then the fact that our apprehension of the moral realm is conditioned by evolution and sociology doesn't do anything to suggest that realm doesn't objectively exist. Uh, you could say the same thing about the physical world. Um, my apprehension of the world of physical objects around me is conditioned by biological and social evolution. But that doesn't mean that the physical world doesn't exist. And so in the same way that I trust my sensory data about the physical world around me to tell me there is a world of objectively existing physical objects, unless I have a reason to doubt them, so I think I trust my moral experience that there is a realm of objective moral values and duties, unless and until I have some good reason to think that these are false or, or delusory. And I don't have such a good reason, it seems to me. All right, I think what we'll do now is take a break for 10 minutes, and then we will come back and I will look at the final argument for God's existence, and then tie this back into the problem of evil once again.